скажу пару водных слов. Всем добрый вечер. Сегодня начинается третий день нашей лекционной программы в рамках нашей научной школы, совмещенной с хакатоном по обучению с подкреплением. И первую лекцию сегодня прочитает Антон Лохматов, который защитился, защитил PhD в University of Cambridge в Великобритании. И он занимался оптимизацией вычислений на специализированных процессорах, если я правильно, ты меня потом поправишь, если что. И, соответственно, сейчас он является сооснователем стартапа, который э, ставит своей целью, ну, может, Антон поподробнее расскажет, э, оптимизацию вычислений э, за счет э, коллективной э, работы разных исследователей, которые запускают разные модели. И идея в том, что, используя информацию о разных запусках, э, проведенных разными, например, исследователями или в рамках ваших исследований при помощи разной конфигурации библиотек, вы могли бы оптимизировать вычисления, которые необходимы вам в вашей работе. Ну, давайте поприветствуем Антона. Спасибо за, за представление. Я в какой-то момент должен переключиться на английский. А, окей, так, на вопросы, главное, на русском. Давай. А... Ты хочешь прямо сразу на английском что-то стартовать? Давай сразу. Ну вот я, я вот пытаюсь, пытаюсь решить сейчас в таком, таком интерактивном режиме. Ну, лю, люди бы, конечно, предпочли русский. Если ты какие-то термины не знаешь, можешь по-английски говорить. Это самый такой простой вариант. Ну, поскольку все-таки лекция, лекция будет записываться. Давайте я начну по-русски, потом это можно будет отрезать. Ага. И уже в основной, основная часть будет, будет на английском языке. Угу. Вот. Мне очень, я очень рад приветствовать всех тех, поскольку и, и я, и мой сооснователь нашего стартапа, мы выпускники физтеха, где мы учились 20 лет назад. И я поэтому покажу, наконец, я, я выведу экран, как... Сейчас, screen sharing. Всем физтехам будет понятно а, следующая формула. Ну, это, в общем-то, dv по dt, то есть, то есть производная скорости и, естественно, это ускорение. И поэтому стартап у нас называется dvdt, если по-английски прочитать. А, поэтому а, сразу... Да, я сейчас пока переключусь на английский, но я постараюсь говорить медленно и разборчиво. So, hello everyone. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk today about cross-platform multi-objective optimization uh, via framework called Collective Knowledge. And I uh, particularly welcome all people from, uh, from the Institute of Physics and Technology, where both mine uh, and my co-founder sta started uh, about uh, 20 years ago. So this is probably the only lecture when I'm not going to talk to you about deep learning and especially reinforcement learning. This is really outside of the scope, but I will try to make it interesting so you understand where we are coming from, what is our angle on our view on the problem of deep learning. So our motivation of working on deep learning comes from uh, autonomous driving or self-driving cars. And you can see here Mr. Bean trying to steer his car. Uh, no, no person is at the wheel, obviously. So we do want to, to achieve this, perhaps, automation, uh, but with more comfort in five, ten years' time. Now, this involves uh, the state-of-the-art uh, computational approaches uh, to image recognition segmentation, which are based on deep learning. So here's the, uh, the obviously, um, the, basic, the basic AlexNet, And you're well familiar with this, I guess, so, but, but just briefly. Uh, this is a um, so-called uh, classification problem where we have images coming to the left. They are being passed through the network, um, are transformed, um, with a certain uh, computation taking place. And at the right, we get a prediction uh, saying to which of the thousand classes 
this image um, belongs. So if it is a kitten, the correct prediction would be it is a kitten. So this is not a, um, a prediction, this is not just a single number. In fact, what is output is a vector of a uh, thousand uh, elements and each element corresponds to a class uh, and uh, the element is actually the probability uh, of, of, um, of this class. So perhaps to, to, to illustrate this better, I'm going to show you a little uh, desktop demo application that we have developed recently. And what is this is going to do, it will use the CPU of, of my laptop and I have selected uh, this AlexNet network for recognition. Um, and I'm going to start this computation. So you can see images appearing and changing and there's five numbers uh, below each image. So I'm going to stop this in a second. Uh, so below you can actually see uh, that my laptop is fairly busy now. So, you know, uh, fairly maxed out. I can see it. Uh, I can hear the, uh, uh, the fan. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite computation intensive what's going on here. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to stop this. And let's take a look at an image. So, for example, this one, uh, if you can see my, my pointer. So the image is, um, um, is a typewriter keyboard, as co is correctly predicted. You can see type, uh, there's a path to the image, and below it is typewriter keyboard 878. 878 is the, the, the number of the class. And below the image, you can see the predictions, uh, five, the top five predictions given by, the, by this network. So in this case, 100% um, AlexNet is sure that this is a typewriter keyboard. The next prediction that even don't, don't matter. But if we take something, something here, uh, for example, the image to the left, uh, so the, the, the top loss prediction is called banded gecko. And the second top prediction, which is actually correct, which is the label of this image, is hyena. And it has a probability of 23% uh, in this case. Okay. So uh, other things here on the image is, is the, the performance of the network. So when, I was, when, I was, uh, when the computation was running, um, it was processing the image roughly in 30, 30 seconds, uh, sorry, uh, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3 seconds. Um, or if we measure the images per second, it was about uh, three images per second. And the two numbers here, they are the top one and top five accuracy. So when, when an image uh, is predicted uh, correctly, and so the topmost prediction uh, is the, the correct label of the image, we increment the top one counter. When the, uh, the correct label is in the top five labels, we increment the top five uh, accuracy. So you can see in this case, uh, up to this point, AlexNet predicted 59% of, of the images correctly, according to the top one metric, and 88% of the images correctly, according to the top five metric. And finally, at the bottom, there's some sort of uh, um, worst prediction um, to the images seen so far, and you know, it's, it's, I will not bother you with the, with the definition that we come, come, come up with, but uh, in this particular case, I can see that the top one prediction, 95%, says this is a courgette or zucchini. And the second, the actually the, the, what the image is labeled with is cucumber. Now, when I look at this image, I can certainly see a cucumber in the background, but in the foreground, I can see a, a courgette. So in this case, I would say that the, the label of the, um, of, of the data set isn't correct. So this or, you know, it's just a very confusing image. But when we go through a data set like this, we can, we can actually get predictions for each of the image. In the data set, we can, we can calculate uh, statistics. And here we are after performance. So now I'm going to select a different model. 
in this, in this case, uh, Google Maps. And I'm going to restart the computation. And let's give it uh, perhaps uh, 20, 30 seconds. So the first thing to note is, is, is that uh, up to this point, the top five accuracy was one. Okay, now it's 97%. So Google Net in general is more accurate than AlexNet. It gives more correct predictions. Uh, and this is the top one. So it is, a, it is a better network in this sense. It's more accurate. At the same time, you can see that the performance of uh, Google Net here is just below two frames per second, two images per second. Whereas for AlexNet, it was uh, about three images per second. So we are trading off accuracy versus performance here. And if you want more correct, if you, if you want uh, more accurate predictions, you would go with, that, with Google Net. If you wanted faster predictions, you would go with AlexNet. Okay, but you can solve the same problem of classif classifying images into a thousand categories by other approaches. So next I'm going to select Another model that was developed uh, at the University of Berkeley, the University of Stanford, and published last year, and it was called SqueezeNet. So I'm going to launch this first. And what you will see is that the, the, the processing speed is much faster than before. So the images are literally f uh, flashing in front of your eyes. And if you look at the uh, images per second metric, it's, it's about 9.5. Uh, sometimes even 10. Okay, so uh, this tells you actually that this network is three times faster on my laptop than AlexNet and about five times faster than GoogleNet. Uh, what about the accuracy? Uh, as you will see later, it has the same accuracy as AlexNet on, the same, on this uh, ImageNet validation set. So you could say this is actually would be a preferred uh, network, again, if you were to trade off accuracy and speed. If you want speed, go for SqueezeNet. Okay, this was one version that they published, and then they came up with, a, with, a, with another network that they call SqueezeNet 1.1. I'm going to select that and restart the computation again. And thing to notice now, the images per second is reaching 18. So this is six times faster than AlexNet, nine times faster than Google Net, and, uh, and it is faster than, and probably two times faster than, than uh, SqueezeNet 1.0. Uh, what about accuracy? It gives you the same accuracy as AlexNet and SqueezeNet 1.0. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this demo application can, can basically show you uh, all the important things, performance and um, accuracy. So, and, and, and usually, so I'm going to, uh, to, to let my, my, my laptop cool down first. So this is what I mean by, by, by uh, telling you about multi-objective optimization. Multi means we may look at accuracy, performance, memory consumption, energy consumption, size and cost and continue with our motivation of self-driving cars. So this is what you see in today's prototypes. So this is, I believe, a car from Audi. And here it says concept, so it is a prototype. And in the boot of this car, you see basically a server with flashing lights. Uh, and if you, if you estimate, probably that thing consumes several kilowatts of power. And it probably costs tens of thousands of dollars when you put it all together. And you literally don't have place for your for luggage in the boot of this car. So what you would like to have is to reduce power consumption and cost and size by at least two and better three orders of magnitude for a car to be a car that we are used to. So some kind of car manufacturers look at the hardware available today and say, this is not possible in the next 10 years. We need to wait until technology catches up. Well, we would like to prove them wrong. We hope that you can actually make 
uh, de deploy de uh, train deep learning networks on devices not dissimilar to those shown here. So this is a slide from a company called Mavideos uh, that was acquired by Intel last year. And they make a processor called Myriad 2 that you can actually go and, and well, you can't buy it, but, but it is available in the USB stick form. So you can stick it into a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi and uh, be able to process convolutional neural networks like AlexNet, GoogleNet, and SqueezeNet uh, much faster than you could do, for example, on, on the CPU of Raspberry Pi. And to the left, you have two offerings from, from NVIDIA. So the, the older uh, Tegra K1 and this, the slightly newer Tegra X1. Uh, the difference you can see that the USB stick, you can place it to your pocket, while these boards come with a large fan on top, uh, lots of components. Uh, so again, this might not be uh, desirable if you're trying to design an electric car that is as silent as possible and suddenly you hear the, the fan uh, kicking in and trying to cool down the processor, well, you might not enjoy your new car like Tesla anymore. So maybe you want something that doesn't have a fan. So this is the motivation for today's lecture. And I'm going to show you results of benchmarking of various approaches uh, to uh, to deep learning on uh, on this board, NVIDIA Tegra X1. So I'm going to skip uh, uh, over lots of code here. So these are uh, these are parameters of the board. If you're interested in that kind of thing, so it has a quad core CPU from ARM running at uh, 1.7 gigahertz. And it has a, a Maxwell architecture-based GPU from NVIDIA uh, running at 1 gigahertz at, at peak. And the board has 4 gigabytes of memory. So a, a bunch of things uh, we're going to look at. Um, we use framework from Berkeley called CAFE, which I'm, I'm sure you, you, all, you all know. And so the first version we evaluated is, is uh, basically running on the CPU as you could see uh, in my demo, uh, using, using an open source library called OpenPlus. Uh, the next versions use uh, NVIDIA's uh, library for linear algebra called QBlus, and a special library for, for uh, deep neural network computations called QDNN. These are fairly recent, so these are, I think, the, the most recent versions available today. Uh, the next version is, is uh, an open source counterpart of QDNN called libdnn. Uh, please note that it is not tuned for this architecture. So currently, when you download this library and it's part of the OpenCL branch of CAFE, it has parameters tuned for the GTX 1080 GPU. So what you're going to see is not quite optimal here, but this is just for comparison. And uh, several other variants we looked into. So NVIDIA CUDA and NVIDIA QDNN are basically identical to the CUDA and QDNN versions above, but they just come from NVIDIA's own branch. And roughly they're equivalent. So um, just for this lecture, I emitted the results from one of the sets. So I, I, I will only use the results from NVIDIA's own branches. And the interesting thing uh, next is actually looking at, uh, at the same approaches so uh, using basic linear algebra for, for CNN computations and using a specialized QDNN library, but at the same time, not using 32 bits of floating point precision, but using 16 bits, okay? So that we call these versions uh, NVIDIA FP16, so with QBLAS and QDNN. And I'm going to show you uh, four models I have demos uh, before uh, on the desktop. And with my one, uh, one more parameter, uh, which is called the batch size. So in the demo, you could see images being processed one by one. Um, when, you, when you want to perform inference on multiple images at once, uh, you may actually batch them. So for example, do, uh, uh, run your computation on two images at once or four images at once and so on. And what this achieves you that on a higher a high end GPU, this reduces the overhead for launching computation on the GPU. And so it becomes 
slower, but at the same time, usually more efficient. So uh, per image. Okay, so I'm going to show you a graph. So if this is not clear, this, this, is, this is fine. But by the way, I, if you have any questions at this point, I'm, I'm quite happy to, uh, to answer. Oh, thank you. Do you have any questions? No. no. Okay. okay. So if, if there are no questions, So uh, in the title of the talk, I, I told you uh, that optimization and benchmarking is done by collective knowledge. So collective knowledge is our own framework uh, that is open source and available on GitHub. So we use it for uh, crowdsourcing, benchmarking and optimization of various uh, real world problems like deep learning, computer vision, and so on. And the nice thing, it actually integrates with uh, data science tools like uh, Jupyter Notebook I'm using here to show you uh, this lecture, um, NumPy, Pandas, and so on. So I have the data available in, in the collective knowledge format, uh, which is basically uh, semi-structured uh, JSON format. And I extract the data so later you can actually go and download the uh, the data for this lecture, okay, and and play with it. But uh, let me go to skip over the code for doing that. So I'm just going to show you uh, graphs um, and a bit and, and some tables as well. So the first thing, let's look at these tables because maybe 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 for some of you maybe easier to grasp in the number form. So this, uh, this table, uh, and let me zoom in. This table is essentially what, uh, what we would see in the desktop demo if we allowed the, uh, the computation to proceed over all 50,000 images of this data set. Okay, so this would be the final, the final number. And the top one accuracy of AlexNet in this case is about 57%. And for SqueezeNet and SqueezeNet 1.0 and 1.1, 1 1 it's even slightly, slightly higher, so getting to 58%. And for GoogleNet, it's almost 69%. Now, uh, the top five accuracy for AlexNet is about 80%. And it is actually getting to 80.3 and 81. So you can see actually SqueezeNet is, despite being faster, at the same time, it, it is also uh, more accurate. But it is not, still not as accurate as GoogleNet that gives 89% top five accuracy in this case. So Please bear with me until I try to find uh, the data. Okay, so some headline numbers. So if I just... Hope you can see this graph. Okay, so on the y-axis, we have the number of images processed per second. Okay, so this is uh, using the best batch size between 2 and 16. In most cases, uh, the larger batch size makes the computation per image more efficient. So in most cases, it is 16, but not always. Okay, so, so for example, let's look at the first uh, group of bars. The leftmost is showing the, the performance of OpenBLAS uh, running on uh, the Tegra uh, JSON board. And on the CPU, it gives about eight images per second. Now, if you use libdnn, uh, you, you, you get 68. With QBLAS, you, you get 99. Now, if you use QBLAS, but, 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 but uh, start using 14.16, so half precision 14 point, you increase uh, the performance slightly by, by 18 images per second. Now, if you go to QDNN, again, another increase, 
And if you go all the way uh, and you use QDNN and 16-bit floating point, you reach almost 200 images per second on AlexNet on, uh, on, this, on this particular hardware. Okay, so the next uh, uh, group of bars shows you the same thing. So, you know, from left to right, the CPU, the, uh, an optimized implementation of the CPU, and, and then go into QDNN in 14.16. Uh, in but you can see that, at, that roughly, uh, Google Net is about uh, two, three times slower on the same hardware than AlexNet. So this is what we, what we could see before, uh, even on my, uh, on my laptop. Okay, and if you, if you look at SqueezeNet, you can see that SqueezeNet 1.0 point, 1 point performs slightly better than Google Net, and SqueezeNet 1.1 point performs almost identically to AlexNet. Now, at this point, looking at this graph, you could say, well, what is the point? Do we want to use SqueezeNet if it gives the same performance? Well, yes, on this platform, they are roughly the same, but you could see on my laptop that SqueezeNet 1.1 was flying through the images uh, about six, seven times faster. Okay, so the answer, it depends. If it depends on the platform, it depends on the libraries you use. Do you have any questions about about this graph? Yes, one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was actually going to ask about the. Uh -huh. Yeah, I actually have a question about the uh, CPU benchmarks here, because uh, uh, you were benchmarking Kafi, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, the uh, convolutions implementations in Kafi are not, I guess, are not the best optimized for the CPU because they use this uh, IM2 call subroutine. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, it's not the best in terms of performance and also memory footprint. Uh, so, I mean, it's probably not, not really fair because uh, no one. As far as I know, no one really cared about uh, CPU convolutions performance in Kafi. I, I'm, I'm actually very happy that you have asked this question. Cool. Uh, yeah, is there anything else? Uh, no. Okay, so, uh, so let, let me answer that. <laughs> so, uh, perhaps, perhaps half jokingly, but, but someone told me it's, that the reason that, um, that convolutions are implemented using, using linear algebra uh, or BLAS are uh, because if one PhD student got a bit lazy at the end of his PhD, he needed to do some convolutional computations. But uh, he didn't fancy implementing them you know, by hand. So he read somewhere that you can actually invoke the library uh, to do convolutionals via, uh, via matrix multiplication. So this is super easy to implement. Okay, so you have him to call. Yes, you consume more memory. But hey, you know, the guy could, could go and uh, submit his thesis of time, defend, and get a job. Now, this lazy approach uh, led to people believing that all you need to do for convolutions is, is to use matrix multiplications. Now, as you can see, even from this graph, that's not very efficient, even on the GPU. So that's why that's the reason why NVIDIA developed QDNF. Okay, and people are not developing, uh, as far as I know, uh, things like QDNF for the CPUs because they know, you know, even even if even if uh, you can make it twice as efficient than matrix multiplication, so what? You know, you're not going to achieve uh, the same throughput as on the, on the GPU. So people don't bother. But in the case of GPUs, yes, it is, it is important. So people start 
uh, writing even open source libraries like libdnn in this case. But this is an excellent question. Yes, this is not the most efficient, but over time, and I think uh, people started, started using uh, GEM, matrix multiplication, you know, four or five years ago, and they started using QDNN perhaps two years ago, and there are other, other approaches appearing. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to keep, uh, to keep an eye, uh, and with time, people optimize more and more. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I can see, I can hear a bit of an echo. So if, if this is a problem, is it, is it okay? Uh, we have no echo because it's, I think it's just because you uh, have no headphones. And so. ah, okay, well, if, if, uh, if you can hear me well, I, let, let's, let's continue. And I will just uh, mute mic and so you will have no echo. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so I'm going to show you uh, some graphs, and uh, this is part of an investigation that that we did, uh, or actually ongoing investigation that we are doing for for our client General Motors, who are interested in uh, uh, CNNs for for self for self driving cars. So I'm going to show you some some of the results, but but definitely not all of them. So just to give you a taster. So this graph basically uh, uh, is, is uh, from, the, from the table I showed you before. Uh, it shows you the accuracy. And from left to right, we have AlexNet, SqueezeNet 1.0, SqueezeNet 1.1, and GoogleNet. And you can see, as I said, that the, the, the accuracy of, of uh, uh, AlexNet and SqueezeNet is below 60%, and it reaches uh, almost 70% for GoogleNet. Okay, so this is the same, the same, the same image, but to illustrate it uh, graphically. Now, if we look at at uh, all the libraries, um, and here the graph plots execution time in milliseconds, uh, this is the same data presented in a slightly different form. So on the left you see the CPU, and then progressively optimized version. So this is inverted. So this is this is not uh, speed up. Or this is not images per second. Uh, this is, you know, uh, the reciprocal. Uh, so, so this is uh, seconds or milliseconds. Okay, so we can zoom in into the data and uh, have a closer look. So, if we drop the CPU uh, bar from the graphs, so we can actually only see the GPU results. Uh, so, this is this is what we are getting. So from the left to the right, uh, libdnn, qblast, qdnn, and the next two versions are using 14.16 uh, for qblast and qdnn. So perhaps you have, you know, it's it's the same information as I presented before, but you can you can you can look at several things and you can say, oh, so for example, uh, qdnn in 14.32 is roughly equivalent to uh, so using QBlast in FP16. Okay, maybe you care about such things. Um, okay, so now we can look at, at uh, um, libraries that achieve sort of comparable performance. Uh, so so using using QBlast, using QDNN, and using LibDNN. And in this case, you can see that the, 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 the yellow bar representing libdnn is always slower uh, than, than the other bar. So the open source library, first of all, I said this is, this is, uh, it hasn't, hasn't existed for long. And second, it's not tuned uh, for the GPU uh, in, on this development board. So this is sort of expected. But I wanted to show you that you can say, oh, well, let's, let's, let's forget about this library. It's not useful. Well, it is. Uh, so we'll come back to this later. Okay, so this is uh, this is showing Qblast. Uh, the, the 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 left uh, the, the the red one is uh, using uh, fourteen point thirty two, and the the yellow one using fourteen point sixteen bits. 
Uh, and you can see there's some improvement, but, but it's not dramatic. It's maybe 20% maybe, uh, at most. So it's up to 20% faster. Okay, so uh, this is the same thing using QDNN. So this is how much you can get across the four networks, across the four models, if you use 16-bit uh, floating point precision. And by the way, I didn't mention this before, but um, using floating point 16, achieves roughly the same accuracy as using 14.32. So what happens is perhaps your, your accuracy drops on 5, 10 images. So with FP32, they are predicted correctly. With FP16, they're no longer recognized correctly. But this is 10 out of 50,000. So you may, well, you, you, you may well say that the, the increase in performance uh, justifies this, uh, uh, this drop, slight drop in accuracy. So this is what most vendors do, they say, uh, if we don't need to use FP32, we will use FP16 or perhaps even 8-bit fixed point or 6-bit fixed point. And the argument goes how many bits are theoretically needed for this computation. And academics say, oh, only one is needed. But then they say, oh, it's like unary arithmetic and it's not really efficient. So there's some discourse there. But um, certainly for certain kind of workloads, uh, you know, 8 bits are quite sufficient. And maybe even less. So this shows that that uh, the six the four, using um, uh, FP16 is perhaps one third faster uh, than using FP32. Okay. So now I'm going to you to show again the same data, uh, but but this time on the x-axis we have different uh, different libraries approaches to computation, and the bars are just uh, grouping the four models together. So in all cases, you can see that this bar, the second bar, represented Google Net, is always slower. Well, again, shouldn't come as a surprise. You have seen this before. Right? Google Net is more accurate, but it is slower. Now, SqueezeNet 1.0 is actually, let's look at this graph, is almost always slower than AlexNet. But SquizNet 1.1 gives you more performance, uh, okay? And in some cases, almost twice as fast. Okay, so, so it depends on the platform. It depends on the, on the device and so on and so on. Okay, and uh, the benefit of SquizNet, I, which I forgot to mention, is it has 50 times fewer parameters than AlexNet. What this means when you have simply, when you have this model file with the weights, the weights for AlexNet, uh, use 250 megabytes, the weights for SqueezeNet use five megabytes. Okay, so 50 times fewer parameters. But as we have seen, same accuracy or even high accuracy, and in, in, in many cases, uh, faster performance. So I'm going to skip a couple of graphs. I, I, I don't want it to be, to be you know, repetitive. So uh, let's get to a discussion, uh, you know, perhaps more interesting discussion later. So, um, some of the same things. Uh, so, yes, on the CPU, Alex, uh, the SqueezeNet 1.1 is uh, twice as fast than AlexNet. And let's keep that. Okay. Now, if you could only measure the time it takes, you know, from the beginning to the end of the computation, you wouldn't actually know how to how to how to optimize it. Uh, whether you could take, uh, have a look at, closer look at some of the layers and, and see where you can improve performance. So this is what the next set of graphs is trying to do. On the x-axis, we have 24 layers of AlexNet. So from, from left, from the input to the right, I'm putting the probabilities. Okay, and just to make it a little bit interesting, I'm comparing, uh, so this is, this is using QDNN on AlexNet. Uh, I'm comparing two different batch sizes. And I'm normalizing to get to the execution time per image, per layer. So you can see in most cases, when you get to 14 or 16, uh, the batch size of 14, 16, they are roughly equivalent when you do convolutions. But uh, the fully connected layers here, in this case, so the, the, uh, the yellow bar is with the batch size of 16, so it is slightly more efficient, so it is slightly faster. 
okay and the same for for the other fully connected layers but you can look and you can you can look at the experimental data and ask questions like this where can i still in, increase uh, increase the performance or for example i would like to plot um data for two batch sizes 8 and 16 and i would like to um sorry this is a live notebook so shouldn't do that and i would like to um to to show the layers that consume at least 10 percent of the total execution time and you can do that you can see okay this is convolution one convolution two convolution three fully connected six fully connected seven Okay, so those are interesting. Now, if we, if we want to compare QBlus, NVIDIA QD in this case, and QDNM, again, we can plot them layer by layer. And the left, the, the, uh, the red one is performance of QBlus. And the, the yellow one is, is performance of QDNM. So you can see, as you would expect, for convolutional net layers, the specialized QDNN library is faster than QBlus. So again, this is referring to the previous question. Yes, it is more efficient to do convolutions uh, by using specialized library. And you can pretty much see it across all the convolutional la layers. So conf2, conf3, conf4, conf5, and so on. But the performance on fully connected layers is the same. Or you know, within statistical error. Uh, what this suggests is that uh, QDNN falls back to using um, QBlus for those fully connected layers, which makes sense. Again, this is, this is just much expected multiplication. Um, but if you look closely, you can actually spot that QBlus performs a bit better than QDNN on the uh, ReLU layers. Okay, you can see slight difference here. It may be slightly noticeable, but uh, it can give you some some uh, some indication that you know there's still room for improvement of even of for QDNM. And this is a I'm not going to uh, to demonstrate this, you know, but but uh, uh, spend spend much time. But this perhaps shows that. Well, this, this shows Quiznet 1.1, and you can see this is a, uh, it has 75 layers. So it's, it's three times deeper, if you, if you will, uh, than AlexNet. But if we look at, at uh, uh, the layers that consume between 5 and 10% of the total execution time, oh, sorry, 20% in this case, um, so the, the the red one is using libdnn so remember i mentioned this open source counterpart of qdnn and the and uh, uh, the yellow one is qdnn uh, again we have the execution time on the on the y-axis so the lower the better so what this means that um so in this case libdnn is actually faster on the on the conv1 layer and it is faster than non relu on one and and then for for expand layers in this in this uh, network design qdnn is much faster okay so so we, one library wins against another uh, you know, on different different layers um interesting perhaps if you're a library developer you can you can probably uh, look at if you if you if 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 you if you are developing libdnn you can look at this graph and you can say, okay, I know where, where I should improve. I definitely should improve on these layers. I should spend more time optimizing. Um, and um, at the same time, the NVIDIA guys could have a look and say, ooh, we, are, we seem to be listening to an open source library. So this, uh, this information is valuable for library developers, you know, be them with, with companies or, or uh, in the open source community. But what can you do with this information? Okay, uh, so what I'm going to show you is, is one example of, uh, of this use. Uh, if you, if you um, do so-called so per layer adaptation. So what if we could, you know, we have a choice of libraries and we can benchmark them and for each layer we can find the best library. What if we could use the best library for each layer? 
what kind of performance we would expect to get. And so the next, uh, the next set of results is showing just that. So uh, for the four networks in this table, you can see, um, if you do this exercise, uh, basically, if, um, this, is, this would be the amount of time spent with each library. So if you selected, for example, um, let's say for, for SqueezeNet 1.1, Okay, so you would run this for for some time on the CPU. You would for some little time. You would you would you would run it for 0.8 uh, milliseconds using libdnn, for 2.5 milliseconds using using qblas, and for and for three milliseconds using qdnn. So this would be the split. Okay, uh, and if we look at this at this network here, this graph. So if you only used uh, open blast on the CPU, you would take uh, almost 70 milliseconds uh, for this network. Using libdnn would be just over 10, qblast about 10, uh, qdnn uh, slightly smaller, um, uh, less, less than that, but the, the ideal solution would be uh, to use uh, libdnn for a bit, use qblast for a bit, and use qdnn for a bit. Okay, so QDNN would be, we probably use for half the time, but you would adaptively switch between libdnn and uh, QBlast. Okay, and the same thing pretty much is for the for the all for uh, all the other four networks. So if you wanted to look at the figures uh, by doing this this adaptation, you could achieve up to eighteen percent performance improvement um, compared to QDNN, which is overall the best solution, but but not the best if you could change this per layer, which, by the way, you can in Cafe. Um, are there any questions about this? Any questions? Any questions? Not yet. Oh. So, Hope, I haven't completely lost you, but um, on, uh, on GTX L80, so the, the desktop GPU, um, our experiments show you, you could actually achieve up to 30% saving because, as I mentioned, libdnn is, is optimized for, um, for that GPU at the moment by, by, by default. Uh, could you answer a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, in Kafka, uh, you could uh, use uh, different libraries for the uh, layers or or how do you say that? <clears throat> yes, it is correct. Yes, so um, network design is described using a proto.txt file. And in that proto.txt file, in addition to describing the type of the layer, you can uh, have a parameter called engine. And you could specify in that engine what you would like to use. The default, LibDNN, UBLAS, QDNN, or for Oriental Plus, they have a special implementation. Uh, I think using FFTs. So, I, I see, uh, but uh, uh, isn't that expensive to use different yep. like uh, to use uh, uh, like uh, the uh, load and unload data to the different code or something? Um, well, cafe, cafe is, is quite abstract. It's not very efficient, actually, because, because after each layer, the data, uh, you know, for example, it goes to the GPU and then it is copied back. So as far as I know, um, I'm not 100% sure, because this is, this is hypothetical savings, and we still need to implement this adaptation mechanism. Um, but uh, what, I, what I was told by, by people as I know, is, is that you can literally switch layers like this. The only problem is that you need to write by hand for each layer uh, where you would like to run it. We can, using this benchmarking data, uh, generate this, product, this optimized product TXT execution plan automatically. So we'll, we'll probably try it at some point when we can get a bit more time. So you don't want to, to write this file you know, for each and every device, you want to benchmark and generate automatically, and this is exactly what we are trying to achieve. Uh, okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so the next thing, actually, you mentioned that you know you may need to switch between more libraries, and in this case, you know, open class is barely visible here uh, in the fully adaptive solution. It's just maybe not even present. Uh, so the question is, the next question to ask, can we get a minimal set of libraries uh, to do that? Well, so let's, let's first ex exclude the CPU library at all. Okay, now, now you can actually see only three libraries in CPU adaptation. Uh, the colors are different now, so the, the, the yellow is Q+. And if we look at, at the figures here, um, uh, again, you can see that it's very similar reduction as before. And if we compare this solution with three libraries versus the, the ideal solution with all the four libraries, there's very little, little performance difference. It's just in the noise, you know, 10 percent perhaps. So you could reduce and use only three libraries, and in the same way you could go and say, oh, let's use only two libraries. Let's use QDNN and QBlast. And I'm just skipping, skipping to the numbers here. For SqueezeNet, you would actually lose compared to the ideal solution by 8%. But for all the others, it would be just fine. You know, maybe maybe small, small uh, uh, decrease. Uh, but the best thing comes if you want to compare QDNF and LeapDNF. So in this case, uh, you get Again, you get about 17% uh, uh, improvement on SqueezeNet 1.1, but you only lose about 1.7% compared to the solution you have all the libraries. But you only use two. Right, so this, this can actually uh, be more attractive, and you, know, you reduce the, uh, the executable size. You don't need to build your build cafe with four libraries, you, you only build two. And yeah, um, just like that. So I, I hope I convinced you that, that doing benchmarking per layer is actually quite valuable because you can use it for optimization. So what I'm going to talk next, I, I have uh, only a few things to say. Um, a few more things. So if you look at the memory consumption of the models, and here I'm just, it's not dynamic memory consumption, it's what uh, CAFE reports, how much you're going to use memory for, for the weight of CAFE structures. So on the GPU, because you need to allocate GPU memory, the copy data, uh, you actually end up using more memory. Uh, but this is the, the, the bad uh, that CAFE requires. And you can see uh, for four variants here, uh, you use the same amount of memory um, for open because they use 14.52 for computation. And for the FP16, you use half the memory, roughly. So uh, this is what, what this graph tells you. Now, uh, this is not the full story, because remember, we, we also talked about the batch size. So this graph shows you, okay, so on the, on the x-axis, the batch size increasing from 2 to 4, 6, up to 16. And on the y-axis, uh, on this side, we have the execution time in milliseconds per image. And on the right, we have the memory consumption in megabytes. Okay, so if I wanted to say uh, how much memory I would use with the batch size of 8, it would go to this graph, and this intersection here, well, it's probably about uh, 270 megabytes. Okay, so extrapolating this on the right. At the same time, you would get about um, um, 68, maybe, uh, milliseconds. So this is on the CPU. So what you see on this graph is, with the increase in the batch size, the memory consumption grows linear. So you start using more and more memory, up to 500 megabytes. But if you if you look at the execution time per image, it doesn't actually increase dramatically. So 
you could say the performance here, maybe about 70 milliseconds of performance here, are quite quite the same. So you may say, okay, I'm, I'm happy with the batch size of two. But here's what you more typically see on the GPU. So again, uh, the memory uh, the memory in megabytes is growing with the, with increase the batch size, but the time per image drops. So for when you have batch size of two, you have about 15 milliseconds with Alex that using QDNM, then you drop to about nine, eight. And you could say, well, actually, eight seems to be good enough, perhaps. I, I use uh, maybe 70 megabytes of memory, but I get, you know, after that, you, uh, you know, this asymptotically, it's the same performance. So are there any, any, any questions about this graph? No. Okay. So I, I hope it is uh, self, uh, self evident. Um, okay, and one, one more thing about memory. So if we look at AlexNet and SqueezeNet, remember uh, on this GPU, they are roughly equivalent of performance. Uh, but uh, SqueezeNet actually consumes about four times more memory than AlexNet, both in single precision 40 point and in half precision 40 point. Okay, so this is the, the, the memory that you need when you run it. But remember at the same time the screen that actually uses five times few, you know, less memory than AlexNet. So this is the difference, you know, the weights, uh, the, the weights are 50 times smaller, but at runtime you use four times more memory. Again, there's another trade-off that you want to consider. You know, do you have enough memory on your device? Um, you know, if you have if you have uh, not enough uh, static memory, or, uh, persistent storage, you may go to you may you may go for Ethernet. If you have more RAM, you may go for AlexNet, and so on and so on. Okay, um, so. I'm going to, uh, the same graph pretty much I showed you before, but instead of showing you um, um, uh, the images per second, I'm going to, use, um, I'm going to show speed ups. So the, rel the, the relative performance of performance. And the first graph is over the CPU. So you can see that when you use the GPU, in this case, for Google Net, it goes 32 times faster than the CPU on this platform. And perhaps, um, you know, for SqueezeNet, maybe maybe 14 times faster. Okay, so if we, if we switch the baseline and and we say, um, how about we use Qblus as the baseline? So now this, uh, this the third bar, which is uh, Qblus is equal to two, uh, becomes the baseline, so it's one. Uh, across all the models. And, and the reason is, as, as we discussed before, this was the uh, adopted approach in CAFE. This is the default approach using, using the basic linear algebra. So this is, this is, what, this is what you see. So uh, uh, using, using the 16-bit faulting point gives you perhaps up to 25% improvement here on SqueezeNet. If you use uh, QDNN, you get up to 41% improvement. And if you, get, if you use QDNN and also 14.16, uh, you get about 2. 2.16 improvement over QBlast and slightly less than, less, less than 2. Okay, and uh, this is again just comparing uh, AlexNet and SqueezeNet. And using these libraries, uh, you can see they are roughly equivalent. But if you use other approaches, so we have some indications that SqueezeNet is actually much easier to optimize. So in some cases, SqueezeNet 1.1 becomes, even on the GPU, becomes much faster. But I'm not showing you these results. 
Okay. So if you remember the question we, I asked in the beginning of this talk, uh, what if we wanted to choose TX1 from NVIDIA and Miriam 2 from my videos on the USB stock? So, uh, I, 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 so going from information from public sources, so last year my videos published a white paper, and they said that they can do, they can run Google Net at 15 images per second. And they say the, the, uh, this is used to use less than one watt per hour. So this makes about 15 images per second per watt. Now, over a year ago, a video showed that they can run Google Net uh, up to 75 images per second and the GPU would consume about 60 power. So this would make about 13 images per second per watt. So roughly, these two platforms are equivalent, you could say. Okay, if you need more power, you would go for the immediate platform. If you need a smaller frame factor um, and the performance is enough for your needs, then you would just use the platform stage. Now, uh, is it the best you can do? Well, interestingly not, because uh, last year NVIDIA for Tensor RT, which is their uh, framework for fast inference, they previously called it GPU inference engine. Uh, and I can only show you the public graphs from NVIDIA from, from their own blogs here. And if we look at the large batch sizes, so, um, uh, so QDNN, uh, gives you about 92 images per second and using Tensor RT doubles that. So it gives you 203 images per second. Again, on the same block, it uh, gives the energy efficiency numbers. So the ones for, uh, for QDNN give you about, uh, for the large batch size, 13 images per second per watt. And using our turns our T, um, you get almost up to 22 images per second per watt. So remember that my video stick is about 15. So this would make uh, the NVIDIA solution uh, 1.5 times more energy. So from the public data. Okay, so, so this is quite, quite interesting and um, so maybe instead of instead of using uh, Telma video sticks, you would, you would want to use uh, this device from NVIDIA. Um, and just for comparison, so we have numbers for different platforms, and this is using the best of GPU. Uh, so the latest uh, GTX 80. So the fastest performance we see is actually exceeding 2,000 images per second. On ImageNet, or oh, not ImageNet, sorry, and uh, achieving 800 images per second uh, on Google Net. But remember that this GPU is maybe 20 times uh, more powerful than the TX1. But um, yeah, if you, if you need that kind of performance, uh, you may be, you may be looking at a different GPU. And one thing to note here is remember what all the graphs, uh, the rightmost bar was always uh, the higher, the, the, the fastest. So this was using QDNM uh, and 16-bit uh, frames. Well, as it turns out, on the GTX N80, uh, they have reduced capability to 40.16. So uh, this, this, this means you can, I think they have 64 times fewer units. 14.16, then doing 14.32. And this can be just a marketing decision. So they reserve uh, devices that are capable of 14.16 to high end uh, models for data service that cost several thousand dollars. So um, uh, it's just an interesting observation that came out of benchmarking this platform. And yes, you can you can you can read about this. It's public information. Um, so 
here what, here's what you get when you look at multiple examples. Okay, um, do you have any, any questions? I'm just about to conclude. Uh, any questions? No. So, I've been literally bombarding you with numbers, graphs, tables, and you know, talking about different devices. Wow, it's, I think you must have been overwhelmed by this. You know, I have certainly been, just, and we all started talking about, so we discussed one platform in detail and touched upon two other platforms. Uh, but there's more, it's, it's not just this graph, you know, this, this slide from the video is what, it's probably you know a year a, a, a year old. Now the solutions for deep learning in GSP are the GPUs uh, uh, special special purpose built circuits, ASICs, um, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. It's actually very interesting uh, how they all perform on different conditions with different networks. But it's it really becomes quickly becomes this, you know. If you know this uh, parable of a wise man touching an elephant, and because they're blind, they don't see it's an elephant. So, for example, one of them touches the trunk of the elephant and says, "Oh, I think it is a snake." Another one goes uh, to the tail and says, "Oh, I think it's a hole." And yet another says, "Oh." It's a task. Well, it's like a sphere. So they all get different concepts about the object in front of them. So we feel this pretty much the same situation in the uh, AI learning community today. So most AI researchers, they are not interested in performance. So they may be using uh, workstations or uh, they, they train their methods in the cloud. But they don't care about inference. Okay, so they, um, they don't get the full picture. Now you get companies like General Motors uh, who say, well, we want to use the train networks and deploy the self-driving cars. Uh, what should we use? And well, at the moment, it's not very clear. So what we would like to do is to crowdsource benchmarking and optimization of uh, AI algorithms, including deep learning, uh, by a set of tools based on our collective knowledge framework that I mentioned. So the first thing is uh, the results in this uh, presentation uh, have been obtained our most developed today framework called CK Cafe, collective knowledge on Cafe. And uh, like CK itself, it's uh, available on GitHub under the permissive license. So you can do whatever you want. And similarly, we are building tools for CK TensorFlow, CK Tiny DNS, CK TransNT, uh, and so on and so on. So this is the tools are growing, and they are all compatible in the sense of uh, you know running through the same workflow with CK, um, with collective knowledge. And uh, gathering the data. Now you can you can too participate in this initiative uh, very simply by by uh, uh, playing with the uh, we think is an Android app. So I'm going to show you here. So if you have an Android device, a phone, you can download this on the phone. And uh, there's some screenshots here. So you can capture an image, tap the recognize button. Um, you can select the model. So uh, the, uh, the models I showed you before, you can download them. Okay, and after after the recognition, you get uh, the prediction. So this is a computer mouse with a very high probability. And if it's if it's if uh, the results are uh, incorrect, you can actually you can actually tap and send the correct result uh, to the server. Uh, this is how the application looks like. So it's a uh, um, magic style uh, green on on black. 
And it tells you it's powered by collective knowledge as you take. Okay, so you by, 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 by running this, well, first of all, you can have fun um, pointing at different objects and, and seeing if they organize correctly using different networks. But you also participate in scientific experiments. So think about SETI at home, stuff like that. So um, your results get uploaded onto our public server, and it has other other problems that we are working on, but this is specific to the DNM. And you can look at the results, so there's a table here. You can uh, prune by scenario, so which network you use. So for example, let's look at all things that have squeezed at 1.1. Uh, at the moment, this is just cafe on the CPU, but in the future, we'll be running TensorFlow as well. Um, you can look at the CPU, so People use Qualcomm, Space Platforms, MediaTek, Samsung, Rockchip, and Silicon, and so on. So there are some results here. And um, yeah, it basically a simple graph showing you the some of the specification time of the image and detailed information about, about this. So uh, this is growing, so this is the, you can participate in those problems yourself. And just to conclude, um, just a few words that it's great to benchmark available models, uh, like like I have done for this talk. Um, but you you could maybe you could design your own. So this is actually what uh, what uh, what is special about about uh, SqueezeNet. So they use one by one and three by three convolution filters. They have also one by one squeeze. Filters. Okay, and so this is the basic block of the network. And they put them into uh, well, they connect them to the layers, and for each layer, they decide how many. Uh, squeeze that, squeeze layer they will have, in this case, 16. How many expand? How many expand? Okay, so there's some, some parameters. Okay, remember, initially they came with squeeze at 1.1 or 1.0, that wasn't perhaps the most, uh, well, the best or a big improvement. But squeeze that 1.1 certainly is. So there's a large number of those parameters. If we could use um, you know, tune those parameters and upload your results at the same time to our collective knowledge uh, repository. You know, people over time would learn what's going on and you know try to find um, more efficient design. So we don't know, uh, but it is possible that that using the same network architecture, it may be possible to achieve the accuracy of Google that. Okay, so ninety percent uh, top five. Uh, but the space is vast, right? For each layer, you can select different proportions of the layers of, of, of the blocks. You can select 10 layers or 5 layers and so on and so on. Because people are not exchanging this information, there's no unified way to share it. I think that's why we're making little progress. That's why it's not so scientific. So I would like to encourage you to, uh, to think about this as a big research problem. That many companies are interested in, many people are trying to solve, but you need to work in collaboration with platforms. And just to finish off and give a bit of time for questions, I so would like to say that we think it's a big mission to optimize computing, so to make it more efficient, reliable, and inexpensive. And like the Blues Brothers, it's like we are on a mission from God, we think that you know it's a really, really uh, honorable thing to do. And we are inviting people to work with us, so to collaborate with us, so we can call it putting the band together. And I'm very happy to, to collaborate uh, with the Moscow Institute for Physical Technology on this. We already have a couple of students uh, working uh, behind the scenes um, on, um, on optimizing linear algebra uh, uh, libraries and optimizing, uh, so working on CK TensorFlow, for example. So if you are interested, uh, in the problems in this domain. So by all means, please get in touch. And we have lots of problems and it's lots of fun solving them together. So thank you very much for your attention.
and I hope it was useful. Uh, okay, thank you, Anton. <clears throat> Uh, actually, we are pretty tight on our time, so we have uh, time for one question. Anybody want to ask a question? No. Then just let thank. Let us благодарим mm Антона. Спасибо -hmm. большое за реально такой как бы очень информативный доклад. Надеюсь, что я не перегрузил всех, но... Ну, слегка перегрузил, но не перегрузил. Ну, без этого никак, да. Если не перегружаться, то мы как бы... Слишком сложные задачи, их нельзя решить. К сожалению, усилиями одного исследователя, усилиями одной лабы, одной компании. Нет, надо объединять усилия, ребята, и я надеюсь, что на плодотворное сотрудничество в будущем. Большое спасибо. Спасибо большое. Удачной школы. Пока. Спасибо.